Hello, it's Scott Manley here, and today I would like to talk to you about The Expanse. The Expanse is a TV show on Sci-Fi Network. It's based on a series of books by James S. Corey, and it's been getting a lot of attention and praise from the audience for its gritty realism. It's a sci-fi universe where there's no faster-than-light drives, there's no artificial gravity, and the spacecraft follow realistic trajectories. Well, realistic assuming you have the kind of magic sci-fi space drives that are used in The Expanse. And so I was asked, just how amazing are the engines used in The Expanse? I mean, they're able to accelerate continuously at 1G for days at a time, and when they're used in an emergency, they're able to uh, generate accelerations of about 30G. While our modern day space probes have to respect transfer windows and follow circuitous orbits to minimize their limited delta V, the spacecraft in the expanse can thumb their nose at the sun's gravity and navigate trajectories that minimize the time taken. Accelerating towards the destination continuously for half the trip and then flipping around and decelerating for the second half of the trip. In reality, the Expanse is a series of stories, and the engines are primarily intended to be gizmos that enable storytelling. Because of this, the writer doesn't go into a great deal of detail about how they work, in the same way that writers of contemporary fiction don't tend to go into great detail about the engines on cars, they're just part of the background. When asked about what they run on on Twitter, the author jokingly replied, efficiency. Now, the engine in the series is described as the Epstein Drive after its inventor, Solomon Epstein. And there's a short story that's published on the TV show's website which tells off the circumstances surrounding the development of the technology. Unfortunately for the inventor, his innovations result in a test ship accelerating at over 7G, pinning him to his seat, unable to shut the drive down, until 37 hours later when it runs out of fuel, having accelerated to 5% of the speed of light and killing Solomon in the process. Those numbers give us a starting point to constrain the engine technology. Now, Solkovsky's rocket equation tells us that the specific impulse and therefore the exhaust velocity, which is needed to achieve 5% of the speed of light, we have to guess at the mass ratio between the fueled and the dry mass. But taking, even, taking reasonable estimates, it puts the exhaust velocity in of the order of 10 to 15,000 kilometers per second. So since I like round numbers, let's just say 10,000 kilometers per second. Our chemical engines have exhaust velocities maybe as high as 5 km per second. That's limited by the chemical energy released by combining hydrogen and oxygen. And there's actually a rough way to estimate the absolute theoretical upper limit on exhaust velocity from a fuel, where you figure out what the velocity it would achieve if all the energy content it had was converted to kinetic energy. That equation is V is equal to the square root of two times the energy density, and that's the per mass energy density. It's an upper limit, it's impossible in reality, because there are efficiency losses everywhere and the exhaust from a thermal rocket will have a range of velocities. The theoretical upper limit for a Hydrolox engine is 528, whereas the RS-25 gets a specific impulse of only about 450. Anyway, this upper limit is useful for sci-fi drives since we can figure out whether there's any real science that could result in a fuel with sufficiently high specific impulse. To get the specific impulse, which is about 1 million seconds, that means an energy density of about 50 terajoules per kilogram. And to get those kind of energies, you need to leave behind the wimpy low energy world of chemistry and get to enter the realms of nuclear physics. Both fission and fusion hit this performance requirement, but consensus among the readers is that the fusion-based propulsion system is what the books portray. There's actually a reference, I believe, to fuel pellets, which is a big pointer to something called inertial confinement fusion power. Inertial confinement works by hitting tiny pellets of nuclear fusion fuel, making them hot enough and dense enough to undergo fusion, and initiating a tiny hydrogen bomb. This is a real-world technology, but it's not reached the point where it can be used to generate power or drive a starship. In fact, one of the biggest facilities in the world is the National Ignition Facility, and it's just down the road from me in Livermore, California. It's the largest laser in the world. However, the massive project still hasn't broken even, 
And, but the data is, of course, relevant to things like nuclear weapons research. And it's also shown up in the movie Star Trek Into Darkness as the warp core of the USS Enterprise. Clearly, in the books, centuries of progress have helped the technology break even and shrink it down to be small enough to fit on a spacecraft. On top of this, you can add a complex set of magnetic and electrical fields to contain the miniature nuclear explosion and then redirect it out of the back of the spacecraft, and that would probably approximate what you have in The Expanse. Now, it's worth considering what kind of fuels this Epstein drive uses. While we talk about fusion as harnessing the same energy source as the Sun, it can't use the same simple hydrogen fuel that the Sun does. Hydrogen fusion is a terribly slow process relying on the strong and weak nuclear forces. The Sun has billions of years to fuse its supply of hydrogen, but sci-fi starships need to burn their fuel up in microseconds. And for that they would use fuels which are easier to fuse quickly. The easiest fuel combo is deuterium and tritium, which has been the focus of most fusion research on Earth. Deuterium-tritium fusion produces a helium nuclei, a neutron, and a lot of energy. But about 80% of that reaction energy goes into the neutrons, which being neutral particles can't be redirected by those electromagnetic fields, and so they can't really produce much thrust. Moreover, neutron radiation just loves to mess up materials. If your spacecraft has thick radiation shielding, then it'll convert all that neutron energy into heat. However, you might have heard of helium-3 as a perfect fuel for nuclear fusion. It's insanely rare. It's one of the most expensive materials on Earth, but as a nuclear fusion fuel, it's, well, quite attractive. The fusion of deuterium and helium-3 will produce a helium-4 nuclei and a proton and a nice chunk of energy. The reaction products are all charged and therefore all able to be constrained by magnetic fields. But it's not perfect. There's no magical perfect pairing of deuterium and tritium nuclei. Some deuterium will react with other deuterium, either producing helium-3 and a neutron again, or tritium and a proton. And the tritium, of course, just loves to interact with that deuterium and make more neutrons. So deuterium-helium-3 fusion still emits about 5% of its energy in high-energy neutrons. Now, if you're doing all this, you have a plasma. The plasma is really hot, and you're going to be losing a lot of energy from this hot plasma via photons. Now, I know what you're thinking. Photons, those are easy. You just put up a mirror and reflect them. But this plasma is so hot that most of the heat actually comes out as x-rays, and those don't get reflected particularly well. I mean, at least you don't need several feet of shielding to slow them down like you do with neutrons. But the other side of this mean is that all that X-ray energy ends up getting deposited into a much thinner layer of your spacecraft, so it gets hotter faster. So let's just figure out just how much hard radiation Solomon's ship would be exposed to. We can guess the mass of his ship. So uh, let's say a 20-ton spacecraft, similar to the mass of some of the modules on the International Space Station. Now, to get the uh, 10,000 kilometers per second exhaust velocity and reach 5% uh, of the speed of light, that would mean a mass ratio of about 4.5. So the whole thing, fuel and spacecraft, would be about 90 tons fully fueled. Since I'm lazy, let's just scale the whole thing to be 100 tons. Now, accelerating 100 tons at about 70 meters per second per second, or 7 Gs, it needs about seven meganewtons of thrust, and that's actually pretty close to the thrust of one F1 engine on the Saturn V. So with the exhaust velocity of 10,000 kilometers per second, that needs about 0.7 kilograms of propellant every second. And that would require, excel, that would require energy of about 35 terawatts, presumably retrieved by fusing the, the fusion fuels in the propellant. Now, 30% of that is what we figured comes out in terms of x-rays and neutrons. So let's say half of that impinges on the ship. Maybe uh, that's 10 terawatts being radiated, about half of it getting at the ship. That turns, that converts to about 50 megawatts per kilogram of spacecraft. And that's enough to vaporize anything I can think of in short order. 
Now perhaps the novel magnetic coil exhaust moves the fusion plasma a long way from the ship. Perhaps it's only a fraction of a percent of this radiation that's actually impinging on the ship, but even that is enough to vaporize most things or perhaps make them overheat without gigantic radiators like we don't see in the TV show. My point of this is that while it's easy to do the math and show that nuclear fusion could produce the efficiency of the Epstein drive, it's still much more fiction than science. If the human race ever does explore the solar system propelled by fusion-powered torch drives, it's unlikely that they'll resemble the spacecraft seen in the TV show. And if you're interested in some really detailed analysis of sci-fi technologies, say because you're a budding author writing science fiction, then I have to give a shout out to a website called Atomic Rock Rockets over at projectrow.com. They do all the math so that you guys don't have to. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.